Hi, my name is Francois Nodea, and this is Super Teachers Unite, the show dedicated to finding out what it takes to teach like a superhero. Now, all of us had that favorite teacher when we were at school, and they were very influential early in our lives, and we remember them fondly. Now, in every episode, I'll interview business leaders and other super teachers so that they can share the stories about the super teachers in their lives that were so influential on the successes that they made of their lives. Now, they'll share stories from the classroom, but as well as the boardroom. In every episode, our guest stories will assist us in finding out, especially if you're a super teacher, what it is going to take to improve your practice. And if you're a business leader, How will you improve your people, your processes, and your profits? Now, if you need me to assist you in finding out how you can teach like a superhero, check out our website at staysuper.co.za. Teachers play a massive, massive part in the decisions that kids make. Children often go to the teachers for advice on making subject choices, career decisions, um, and teachers are seen as massive influences in the decisions that kids make. Now, I believe it's very important that we invite an expert on decision making to assist teachers in understanding a framework that we can use when we give advice, but also that's going to help us to make better decisions. So in today's episode, I speak to Mitch Balker. Now, Mitch worked for two of the biggest brands in the world, that's Samsung and Nokia. And now he's building businesses across Africa and the Middle East. He's the COO of Iconic Collective. And today he speaks to us about making better decisions, just understanding the idea or the framework of making decisions and I believe this is going to help a lot of teachers in number one making better decisions of their own their own career decisions or just life decisions and then in turn is going to help us when we give advice to kids when they are making big decisions in their life. I hope you're going to enjoy this one. Right Mitch the audience knows you now but I'm sure that the teachers are going to want to stalk you on all of the platforms but where would you say is the best place for our teachers to go and stalk you? Thanks so much Francois. The best place to definitely be uh, LinkedIn they can just search Mitch Bauka or MitchToTheB.com. All my details are there. Excellent so please teachers go out go and see what Mitch is doing. There's amazing things. I'm um, enjoying getting business owners and people, uh, entrepreneurs, people in corporates to speak to teachers so that we can broaden our horizons and we can figure out exactly how we can prepare the stage and prepare the world for kids that's going to, you know, working into a world, walk, walking into a world that's very uncertain. So um, Mitch, it's an absolute pleasure having you on the show. And as we do with all of our guests, Please tell us about that super teacher you had when you were in high school or school in general. Yeah, thanks, Francois. You know, um, listening to some of your previous episodes as well, uh, I I love that you asked that question. And and as a super teacher yourself, I absolutely love what you're doing here. So thank you so much for having me. I'm really, really excited to be here. Uh, I've got two two super teachers. I know I know that's breaking the rules a little bit, but I really couldn't split these two. So I'm gonna I'm gonna share a story for for both of them, and uh, they are at high school. So I went to best school in the world, Pretoria Boys High, and um, my uh, my first super teacher was was my art teacher. His name was Peter Binsbergen, absolute legend. Like he just was next level, used to smoke in class, listen to heavy metal, just like completely take the learning environment to the absolute max. He used to let me get away with murder as well. I wasn't the most diligent student to say the least. So I I loved being at high school. I loved being in hostel, but I did not enjoy learning. Um, Unfortunately, during school, I I didn't take it very seriously. I only learned the value in learning and and bettering myself after school. And and that's one big, big thing I wish I had taken a bit more seriously. But but Peter Binsberg, and he just pushed me personally on a whole nother level. He questioned everything I did. Um, My first official job or paying job, should I say, was I was actually a DJ. I started DJing in school. And I bumped into him about 
three years after I left school and he heard that I'd gone into corporate and he was mortified. He couldn't believe it. He's like, no, we've lost one of the creatives to corporate. So I always just valued like his just belief in his students, especially me. And he would see like a little bit of gold in you and he just try and polish that gold out with everything that he did. So that, that was all, all Mr. Binsbergen. And um, so he was my, he was my favorite teacher, but my best teacher by far was um, Melanie de Kock, and she was my, my maths teacher. Um, I actually loved maths. I, I found it very easy, which was quite interesting for a lot of people um, that I was studying with at the time. But like I mentioned, school wasn't a real priority for me. So I actually intentionally dropped from higher grade to standard grade maths so I could skim through it and get an A. And that's what I did. So I did bare minimum with maximum results. There's a lesson there somewhere, but but um, but yeah, she she was really good. She she just kind of saw through through the nonsense. Um, I was this loud, funny kid. I would always try and put a wall up by being that guy. And she just kind of like looked into my soul. She knew what my game was, and and um, I was actually going through quite a lot personally. My my father had passed away when I was when uh, when I was sixteen, so she was my matric teacher. So I was dealing with a lot, and she just kind of like stood toe to toe, looked me in the eye, and was like, "I see you. I'm here to help you. Like, let's make this work." And and I always valued that. And for years after school, she's like, "How are you doing? Are you well?" Like just just from afar but just kind of that guiding hand so and and i i got an a for her subject so she obviously taught me pretty well as well but yeah those, those are my two super teachers so that that's amazing i think there's a lot to unpack in what you just mentioned and um one of the things that i mentioned in the keynote talk that i do at schools is exactly this difference between your favorite teacher and your best teacher and there's not necessarily like a good or a bad thing in having favorites or bests but if you can, if you can be that that middle ground, and you can become a learner's like favorite teacher as well as their best teacher, I think that's like a, a, the Goldilocks zone that teachers can can move into. But you mentioned this thing, and I want to know whether you think it's true that lose you. The, I think the the words, the phrase that you used was losing a creative to corporates. And I think there's a lot <laughs> of people out there that think that 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 in a in a corporate environment, there's no space for creativity. Sure. So, so I think, um, Francois, to answer that question, I think directly related to creativity is we, we can sometimes get confused between being creative and being artistic. Um, so, so being creative and being artistic are two very different things. And um, I think everyone is creative. I think everyone can be creative. Um, it's just in, in a very different format. So, so yeah, so my, my background is, is in marketing and um, I, I grew up in corporate actually. So, so although I wasn't DJing and, 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 and painting anymore, I was, I was using those skill sets, I guess, in a very different way um, in, the, in the corporate animal uh, that I was a part of. I, I had the opportunity to work for some, some fairly large corporates um, in the mobile industry. And um, the last corporate I worked for was Samsung. And uh, there you have to be creative every single day in terms of, you know, how you're going to meet the number, how you're going to come up with stuff that sells better than other people. And then I kind of took those skill sets and moved into agency space, which, which I'm in now. So, so my, my creative abilities were definitely the foundations were laid. I guess my artistic side takes a hammering um, still today, but the creativity has just got a different, a different way of, of kind of executing itself in a day to day now. Now, you also mentioned that you enjoyed mathematics, but that, that you also enjoyed art. And that's, that's something I think that there's so, sort of a, a stereotype around that, that people that are, you know, left brain, right brain, because of all of that, it's a, a load of nonsense anyway. But having, having people who are creative typically don't also, um, you know, enjoy the mathematics and the sciences and getting the arts and mathematics together. It seems like that those two came together for you in your life when you were at school. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so it's, it's quite interesting. Um, I hadn't actually thought of that before around those two, you know, the left and the right brain uh, subjects that they just, I guess they were both different types of challenges. So I've always really been, I always try and pursue a challenge and, you know, mathematics, I mean, it's maths, you know, we all know the challenge that comes with maths, but from an artistic point of view, there's also a different um, execution and maybe more of an outlet for the challenge to like come to life. So I've definitely used those skill sets in 
going into from a corporate into an agency much more uh, creative and artistic space but very analytical from the business management and you know revenue commercial sides of that as well and in my um my latest keynote as well i talk about the the two things that uh, so the one thing i've been going to war with lately is how to make better decisions um to equip us all to as business leaders it doesn't matter you've if we can get good at making decisions you know we kind of prevent ourselves from getting caught in what I've termed an indecision trap, which leads to procrastination and anxiety and poor communication, et cetera. And my going to war is on the idea of how emotion and logic has an effect on our decisions. And I guess that's that left and right side as well as it's the emotion and the logic. It's, it all, it all plays into each other. Absolutely. I definitely want to delve deeper into the decision making. And I think there's a lot of relevance, especially um, in schools, there's a lot of decisions or choices that needs to be made. But before we get there, what I wanted to mention is teachers can easily um, box or put, put kids in boxes, like realizing yeah. earlier that some of them have got autistic talent and say, oh, you're creative, you should go in a, a creative direction, or you're good with math, you're good with science, you're good with computer um, literacy, or so you should move in, in that kind of direction. Um, and we should mm. really watch out as teachers, as we have got the influence, um, we, can, we can really make yeah. major damage in the lives of kids in the decisions that they make by the, the, the predetermined ideas that we have for those individuals. And the example that I, that I like just thought of is somebody like Leonardo da Vinci. I mean, amazing mathematician, inventor, and artist. I mean, we can't, yeah. we can't be boxing people. Yeah, I, I agree, Franza, you know, I think there's definitely something to be said there. So, you know, even in the workplace, when, when we're working with our teams, and when we're working with our clients as well, we have realized something that that is quite important to get right early on. And, and it's kind of this boxing in framework that you're speaking about. So, so I think people naturally will, will thrive when there are boundaries in place. So we do need to kind of set a bit of a framework and a boundary, but, but I think how we play in that boundary is really up to us. And I think we have to have the freedom to do that. So I remember when I was at school, uh, I, I, I had these teachers around me that definitely let me operate and have the freedom to express myself and, and thrive in certain areas. Uh, but I didn't have, so as I mentioned, my, my, my father passed away and uh, my mom, you know, she, she had a lot going on as well. So I didn't really have a parent to say, you will do this or you won't do that. And I think complementing that with the teachers at times, I did feel like I did maybe need a little bit more of a box mm -hmm. um, because I, I, I had a tendency to run away on my own and, and not really be sure of what I wanted to do or, or how to, to move forward. So the boundaries are important, but definitely don't close the lid. So it's like, like it's striking that, that balance. And once again, I want to use the term, the Goldilocks zone is you don't want to be like overly constricting and not allowing yeah. space for anybody to move. And you don't want to set the boundaries or not have any boundaries um, to such an extent because creativity can't thrive if there's no constraints. Um, if you tell people 100%. like, like draw, just draw anything. You get that thing about, okay, but it's like decision, like, uh, like, like this decision paralysis. I've got all this choice. And I don't know what I'm going to do with it. But by setting those constraints, you start moving within a, a specific direction. So finding that balance is important. Yeah, agreed. 100%. So I'm obsessed now, possibly for the last eight years. I'm obsessed with finding out what are the traits that great teachers have in common. Now, you've, you've mentioned that you've got these two super teachers. What would you say with the traits that they had, the characteristics that they um, had that still stick with you today that said, okay, those, those traits made these teachers memorable for me? Mm. So my art teacher, Peter Binsbergen, you know, we, we've, we've spoken about this, Francois, a few times um, offline is, is like best version of self, right? So he was like that guy. Like he's like, this is who I am take me as I am or flip and go to go do another subject. And I just loved that audacity that he had in the classroom. Um, and he was, he was, he was such a sticky character. So once you were brought in, you know, you would go to war for him and, and he really had the ability, as I mentioned, to just like get the best out of you. And he was probably one of the only teachers throughout my whole learning 
career, if we can call it that, of like informal education, so like primary, high school, tertiary, where he would also just call you out. <laughs> He's just like, it's not good enough. Like, you are not doing this. And it, I, I wouldn't even say it was with radical candor. He was just like, that is rubbish. <laughs> like, do it again. And, you know, you you almost had this element of, I don't, I don't want to let him down. So, um, by the, because he believes in me so much more than I believe in myself. So he really helped you deal with that kind of, you know, I want to strive for greatness. So, but that was just because of who he was. And, and, and so just, he was like the best version of self. And then so, Melanie, the toy, she... so, sorry, Mitch, that, that would be like authenticity, like knowing who you are, like not being afraid of polarizing. Cause I think a lot of, a lot of teachers want to make friends with with kids and like want to have favor with everybody. But what I'm hearing from you is like he was authentically himself, um, had had specific principles that he worked with, and um, that 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 um, uh, you used radical candor. But I mean that that tough love. Like I'm not yeah. I'm not holding any punches because you need to know the world out there isn't going to hold the punches. So let's get it. Let's get used to it now. Yeah, and and it was. You know, it's quite interesting how you say, like, some teachers want to, like, make friends. Like, we all wanted to be his friend, but we weren't. (laughs) And that's kind of the relationship that he created because we respected him so much. We, we you know, as an 18-year-old, you're like, this is is the guy. He's the art god. And um, I wanted to be like that. I wanted to be able to just know what I'm painting or what I'm drawing, and I don't care what the world says. So... So we definitely, um, we, you know, he rubbed off on us in such a good way in terms of, of trying to be better, but he wasn't there to be our friends. He was there to teach and push us to levels we didn't know um, we had inside of us. And there are still some guys today that, that uh, I was in class with that have gone on to do great things in the art world because of, because of the way that he just kind of, you know, pushed them, which was great. Uh, sorry, I interrupted you when you wanted to mention the, the, the traits of the other teacher. Yeah, so, so, you know, Mrs. DeCock, she was really around, um, I guess, opposites is just like deep empathy. And, 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 I don't, and I don't mean like sympathy again, you know, I think that's a word where people tend to mix them up a little bit. Like empathy, it was really like, how can I serve you? How can I support? How can I listen? How can I make you better by, by just serving myself? Um, she really modeled that like servant leadership really well. Uh, but also, you know, when you, you when you were looking for sympathy, she wasn't that teacher at all. Uh, we I had other teachers like that, that, you know, if I was having a bad day or felt sorry for myself, they'd be like, it's okay, you'll be all right. She wasn't that person. But but you could really feel, you know, if you had a problem or there was something that you were struggling with, not just in the classroom, she really did actually want to help you, but help you help yourself kind of thing. So empathy would be the other trait, without a doubt. And this, I think what you've just mentioned in showcasing the two teachers that you spoke about is that you won't find the ideal traits for a teacher, like all of the traits in one individual. And that's why it's so important to have what I call the, like the Avenger effect. It's like, you've got your superpower, you know what your strengths are, but you need to collaborate with the other teachers because where, 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 where they, their strengths are, it's quite, might be one of your weaknesses and they complement you on that. Yeah. So having access to both those teachers in different classrooms um, gave a quite a, a unique balance to your schooling. Yeah, hundred percent, Franz. So I think I think that is super important. I wouldn't just say for teachers, but in business as well. You know, we all have our strengths, and you know, there's there's a saying um, from I think it's uh, Ariana Huffington that she said, you know, the best thing she ever did in business was hire her bi- biggest weakness, and that's kind of the same same thinking is we can't be at all to everyone and that's why companies and organizations are created is to to try and find that avenger effect i I really like that by the way um is to be able to take like all of our our assets and abilities and bringing them together to to you know kind of win the battle i like that a lot no thanks for supplying me with an awesome segue into the next question when we speak about hiring people so as I said, I'm obsessed with identifying these traits, but what's more important for me is bringing great talent, bringing the best teachers, the super teachers, and getting them into the schools, their own dream schools. And that's why we started the recruitment company called Go Teach. Um, and what, I'm, what I want to figure out, and that's why I'm speaking to so many business leaders and people who, who are successful in corporates, 
is to figure out exactly their hiring practices or what are the things they're looking for when they assemble their team. Because I think schools should start to operate like businesses and realize that when we, when, when we hire teachers, we, we need to really um, look at industry where things are successful. So my question to you then, Mitch, um, when you hire people, when you decide that you're going to work with people, what are you looking for when you do that? So Francois, what we've created in the agency space predominantly is we, we understand that one, we're as good as our last job, right? And because we're, a, we're not a huge big corporate business, we all rely and work with each other very closely. So even though in this new, new era of remote working, we're not necessarily all in the office to, together every single day, there's an underlying thread that needs to connect us all so so our culture is really important so when i look at hiring someone to the team you know your cv will tell me what you're good at you know it's it's the how and the why that i'm more interested in and so the the first thing i would say right off the bat is i look to see how brave you are that is one of the big things that we try and identify in our in our first interview process is just to understand your bravery. Um, that's a big part of our culture. And, you know, being in advertising, you got to be brave. Uh, you got to be courageous and you've got to you got to be able to take a few knocks along the way as well. So so we look out for our, like courage, bravery. And um, that's super, super important for us. And. I also like to ask people, it's kind of like a double negative. So I say, why shouldn't I hire you? And I think when the way that people answer that question for me is most, most often than not, if I decide to move on with the process is purely because I want to see that you have the self-awareness and empathy to, to judge yourself, to be aware of your flaws, but also you're very aware of how to fix them, or you're at least trying to, or you're looking to better yourself, et cetera. So so if people kind of fold under that self-awareness question, it's probably not going to work for you purely because we're a, we're a business that, that thrives on that courage. And, and we need to know that, um, you know, our CEO, he's got a great saying where he talks about how like the Spartans, your, sh your shield is the weapon that you are given when you become a man. It's not your sword. And your shield is to protect you and the guy next to you. And, and together, that's kind of like how you win as, as the Spartans used to move forward. And that's kind of the same thing in our business that we built is around, you know, what are we doing to shield ourselves and others so that we can kind of move forward together. So, so those are the things that we would look out for. Awesome. So practically, how, how do you, how would somebody showcase their bravado, how brave they are, the, the courage that they have? How would they practically showcase that to you without them really bullshitting it? Yeah. So, so Franzo, I'll ask you the question. What's the bravest thing you've ever done? Uh, I've got two, and, and the one the one would be like standing up after a divorce. It's like after being like totally like broken and battered. Uh, that would be that would be the one. And then the second one was like jumping out of the air, uh, an airplane for skydiving. I think that was. But I also didn't have a choice. It's like my my best friends took me out like on my 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 bachelor's party. And like here's a plane, you jump. So it's also like you don't have a choice. But so okay, so in in that instance, you're asking somebody. To, to provide evidence from their life, a story from their life uh, that that would be an example of their bravery. Yeah, and and so some of the things that I look out for is how did they answer it? Was it just kind of direct? Was there a bit of fluff added to it? Are they trying to make their bravery look more brave? Or you know, so there, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of great great ways you can kind of identify that. So I mean, your story was straight to the point. Not a lot of rubbish there, and very cool stories i will share with you one of the best stories i ever got with that question just as a little side note i asked that question what's the bravest thing you've ever done and the answer was i saved my best friend from getting eaten by a crocodile can God, you believe hired. it you are in <laughs> and uh, yeah so so i mean that's those are some of the answers we get but just the way he told that story, I was like, this has to be true because you could actually see him changing color, like going white, just thinking about it. So, so yeah, so it's a great, it, I think it's a really great thing. And it's one of our values in the business as well is um, courage and bravery. So we try and look out for that. And we feel that's what helps us kind of change the status quo in, in the space we play in. So I, I think I, 
immediately doing, I, I do a lot of interviews for the, for the recruitment company and I'm definitely stealing this. You, you better know this, <laughs> but I'm immediately thinking of people trying to game, trying to game the interview space. And a typical answer that somebody would give to that question is like, what's the bravest thing I've ever done? It's like showing up for this interview. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if you get, you know, deciding to change my career, it's like, shut up, man. Just give yeah. me the real answer, you know? So yeah. And and it's 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 one that and like I say, when we when we're interviewing, it's really around culture. You're in the interview because we know you can do the job. We just want to make sure that that you're there for the right reasons and that you know ad, advertising is brutal. It really is. There is um, you know, and teaching as well. I mean, geez, what you guys do every day with those kids in certain age groups is honestly a miracle that you go home every day and decide to go back. So, so it's really important that everyone's got, we like-minded. We, we also want to, you know, like I say, protect each other, but we, we, we need to feel connected. And, and that's why we, we really focus in on that, that area of the interviewing process and just some people in general. And that's also, you know, when you're checking in and um, I don't know how it works in schools, but you know, often, often, you know, every three to six months, we kind of get together, direct reports. We understand where everyone's at. We see how we performance, uh, how performance is doing as individuals, as a business. And again, we say like, guys, what are we doing every day? To what, what, Where are you being courageous? How are you stepping out? How are you stepping up to lead? What are you doing differently? Because um, if we know that that's a big part of someone's life, then it's something that we can play into and keep pushing them on. And then obviously that like, you know, builds the business up together. Yeah, because... It- if there's a specific set of skills needed to do a job, there's probably 10 people who've got those skills that can do it. If you're operating at a high level, it is the culture fit then that, that makes such a massive impact in a, in a company. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Mitch, I'd like to delve into decision-making because that's your, your area of authority um, and you have developed a keynote around decision-making. Um, now, in schools, there's a lot of space where decisions need to be made. If you're the principal, I mean, there's, I mean, that's basically being the CEO, uh, the CEO of a company. There's yes. decisions every single minute. Teachers have got a lot of impact or influence on decisions that uh, that kids make. But then also, like, except for the daily choices and decisions that kids have to make, the biggest ones that I that I identified is in grade nine, where there's subject choices. There's grade yeah. 11 where they need to start deciding on career paths um, and specifically like which universities they want to go to, which jobs they're going to apply for. Um, so from a decision point of view, where, where do you start? If, if somebody says, okay, I need to, I've got an X amount of choices and I need to make a decision. Like, how do you start? Yeah. So, so I think Francois, the, 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 there's two things that we need to just be aware of when it comes to, to decision making. And, and there's a difference between decisions and making choices. So I'm going to share with you first of the decisions, right? So I've done a lot of research and studies around how, how to make better decisions. And of all the research that I've done in my personal experience, in my personal life, as well as in in, in the workplace and in the industry that we're in, everything happens really quickly. And we always are surrounded by situations that often we can't plan for, right? So, so your situational analysis will never help you make better decisions. It will always be when you're in the situation, how do I respond more effectively? And the thing that does this is our brain tends to create this environment where our emotion and our logic start to go in tension with one another. So, What happens is if you're in like a high pressure environment and it's at a school or at work, whatever it is, you can often start to feel a lot of negative emotions like procrastination or anxiety. So, you know, if I speak from my own own experience, grade 11, like what I want to study, procrastination was at my door all day, every day until matric. (laughs) And then I had anxiety because flip, I haven't made a decision, you know? So um, I've I've developed this, this format around which, which I believe is when you start to feel these emotions starting to bubble up inside of you. So you starting to suffer from anxiety, starting to, to procrastinate day in and day out. And you, you start to procrastinate as a way of subsiding your anxiety. And then you get anxious because you procrastinate. If you start to get into this little loop, it's called an indecision trap. 
So you need to go to work with whatever those things are causing those behaviors. So whatever's causing you anxiety, whatever's causing you um, that to procrastinate, those are the things um, where this, this model that I've developed will help you kind of assess the situation a bit more effectively and then give you the tools to kind of um, respond to them, them more effectively as well. The reason why it's important that we do this is making decisions gives us confidence. When we make decisions, whether the results are good or bad, the fact is that when we start to make decisions, we start to get more confident in making decisions and that starts to alleviate the pain that we find when we have anxiety and when, when we start to suffer from serious procrastination. So we have developed a, a format where we will be able to acknowledge you've got your emotion and your logic and you have to understand that together these two live in harmony. So in my keynote, there's a, there's a point that I make, which is emotion is the captain and logic is the ship. You know, a, a captainless ship will sink and a shipless, uh, a captainless uh, ship will sink and a shipless captain will, will drink. So they've got to work together. If they don't work together, that's where we start to find this tension. And, and we, we often start to feel like we're fighting with ourselves. You know, late at night, you start to develop these scenarios in your head and you're no longer relying on fact. You're relying on situations to try and create the fact for you. So, so the ideal situation you want to be in is, what are the decisions you need to make that are causing you high emotion? And are you using high logic to, to answer these, these decisions? So when we find ourselves in that em environment, we are emotionally coherent. And the tool there is that we need to respond, right? So how do we respond? So we respond by, first of all, as I said, taking our emotion. And if we find ourselves highly emotional with low logic, we can tend to be intensely illogical. So I remember myself being a 16 year old boy, emotions were pumping all the time. So, um, and logic was definitely low. So I lived in this intensely logical space for, for most of my high school career, I think. And, um, and often the best thing that we can, we can uh, tend to do in the situation is by we reframe the situation. And often because we're emotionally charged, it's very difficult to do that. So by reframing the situation, we need someone, an external party to help us kind of, you know, ask better questions. So for example, um, I don't want to do maths. It should be like, what is making maths difficult? Or why are you struggling with maths? Or I don't know what to study. It's like, well, what, what excites you? Or rather, don't worry about what do you want to become? It's what can I do now that brings me joy that maybe I'll make a living out of later. So by reframing the situation, we move that emotion and that logic into that, that high emotion, but then we start to bring in a bit more logic into the situation. If we are only making logical decisions with no emotion, this is analytical restraint. So this is where we find ourselves just kind of almost being robotic. We can also have a tendency to create uh, another form of procrastination with perfection, where we try and make everything dialed in and super perfect, and then we actually don't move forward. So for example, I'll decide what career I want to take when I get straight A's and then you get straight A's and you're like, but if, you know, straight A students should be looking at what is the perfect. So we can start to get caught up in this, um, this framework that can refrain us from pushing the emotion into the situation. And therefore, again, it's not a great place for us to be in. So we need to be able to renew our perspective when we find ourselves stuck in this trap. And the best way to do that, I found, is by getting external people to, to kind of guide and lead. Um, so, for example, like business mentors or coaches, life coaches, um, you know, peer-to-peer -peer responses and taking the situation and being able to say to them, right, I've got this area that I'm really struggling to decide and I'm not really feeling emotional about it. Or, you know, my mom says I should go and be a doctor. It makes perfect sense because I get straight A's for the required subjects, but there's nothing about it that gets me excited. Um, so getting your peers and your parents in that case, I guess, to kind of renew the perspective and find out where the emotion is, is, is lacking and what can we do to find that emotion or how do we re renew the situation so that like what does get you emotional and then we bring the logic back up into that situation. So we always want to play in an emotionally coherent space where our emotion is high and our logic is high. And the far opposite side of that is actually unemotional irrationality, which is our emotion is low and our logic is low. And I, 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 I truly believe that this is actually where a choice lives and not a decision. So if you've got low emotion 
And low logic, this is a choice. This isn't a big decision in your life. And um, I speak quite, quite a lot in my talk around the ability to make one undecision to remove the unnecessary choices in your life. And um, so, so famously, you know, Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, they, uh, they were famously for wearing the same outfit every day. And that was just one undecision to stop having to worry about the choices they need to make about uh, what to wear every day. So the, the, the undecision was to wear a black turtleneck sweater. The decision that they made was to still wear clothes every day when they went to work, but the choices were removed. Um, and I think we need, you know, teachers need to understand where are they pushing their students to, to make the right decisions, not choices. The choices are there. The cho you've got nine subjects to choose from. The choices are laid out in front of you. We know that one of them, but what's the decision you're going to make then that, or the undecision you need to make so that the choices are, are done and they never have to be dealt with again or never questioned again. Or Because that again, when we make choices and we put all this effort into choice making rather than decision making, we create new decision indecision traps for ourselves because we're spending our energy and our cognitive biases mental fatigue, all of these things, we're spending them on the wrong side. So, so the real response there that you need to find if low emotion and low logic is release. What do you need to do just in your life to release these things, get them away out of your, out of your, um, your mental energy space so that you can focus on the things where you need to respond and, and find a way to, to push that emotion and logic into them. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of value. I found myself like just listening because there's a lot of, there's so much value in what you just said. And I think the important thing is this, this juxtaposition of um, emotions and logic. Um, and I thought yeah. as you were speaking, I like uh, the, 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 the instances in my own life where, where these things were relevant. I mean, one of the biggest, like, uh, I don't want to call it an indecision trap necessarily, but one of the, the failures of a relationship can come in with just the stupid question of what do you want to eat tonight? 100%. Just that question has ruined relationships. And if you, if you can't like realize, okay, am I going to respond here out of emotion? Am I going to respond here out of what's the logical thing to eat? Okay, or maybe you just don't care. You don't want to make the decision. But that thing that you just said about just making the decision itself is already rewarding. Like if you don't yeah. want to make the decision, just tell your partner, listen, I, I can't care what we eat tonight. My decision is to not make a decision. It's totally up to you. But it's when, yeah. when people, people are not, um, 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 I want to use the word affirmative, but that's not the right word. I'll, I'll get to it now. But when people don't have the, like, the stomach to make a decision, that, that in itself is just like uh, protracts issues and, and, and the emotion then can, can heighten. And when our emotions heighten, our logic tends to dip in that same moment. Exactly. Yeah. So, so um, I often use the example, I don't do the what's for dinner, but it's like, what do you want to watch tonight? It's like, that's, that's the also another contentious issue in our lounge. And um, my wife and I have two very different tastes in, in viewing pleasures. So <laughs> often that becomes a, a rigorous debate, but I've also just realized, so, so, you know, the decision actually is we will be watching TV tonight. What we choose to watch, I fully just let her make that choice because the decision's been made. We're watching TV. So I'm, I'm comfortable with the fact that I'm going to be watching television. What I watch is very low on my emotional and logical radar. So I don't, I don't care to make that choice. So I give that authority over to my wife, which also saves me a lot of pain and time. And we end up watching Grey's Anatomy or The Block or whatever. And cool. When she's not around, then I take the decision-making ability. I'm like, right. What are we watching tonight, Mitch? You know, like let's get let's get into something amazing, and and then, the then, then I'm excited. Uh, exactly. But now, we we are making light of this because that, that that's quite. I also want to say um inconsequential uh, decisions or choices that you that you make. Um, but when it comes to something like subject choices, because you've got a specific career in mind, so the the the, the long term goal is what career should I um, move into? Yeah. Those, those kind of, I want to say life altering decisions that if you choose one path, it's going to take up a lot of your time. It's going to take up, or at least take up a lot of the, 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 the rest of decision paths that you are going to take. That, that fork in the decision tree, if you wish, is quite yes. big when it comes to, to something like career choices. 
And as you mentioned in uh, when you spoke a little bit earlier, is this there's a lot of external influence on your decisions. How do yeah. how do we as teachers assist uh, the kids in our class to um, to take external influence and take advice? But then at the end of the day, not just going with what their parents want, but actually making a decision for themselves. Yeah. So, so Franz, so it, it's so interesting that uh, while we're chatting about this, I was, I was also just thinking, you know, if, if I could go back to, to 16 year old Mitch or 15 year old Mitch to say, okay, now is your time. What would you do differently? And so, as I mentioned, you know, em our emotion is the captain, right? So that's, that's the thing driving the ship. But we need the ship to get across the seas. So when I say emotion, we've got to remember emotions twofold. It's, it's, it's a high, happy, you know, jovial. And then there's also the fear and scary, et cetera. So, so what is the thing or the subject or career part that's making you emotional? So either you're super pumped about it, like, yeah, I'm going to be an astrophysicist or, oh, I can't be an astrophysicist because I, I, I don't have the skill set, but I'd love to be. That's emotion. So then definitely, right, astrophysicist seems to be the career path that we should be exploring. And then, you know, your emotion, your external factors can be, okay, well, Mitch, you really suck at science. So <laughs> astrophysicist is going to work, but only if you do X, Y, Z. Are you willing to make that commitment to that decision? And if the answer is then no, well, then maybe the emotion was a little bit too high and the logic was a little bit too low. So maybe it's not an astrophysicist, but maybe just starting off as maybe just a general scientist or, I mean, I'm speaking in an area, I have no idea how this works. So I know, I know you do, you, you'll definitely correct me. I'm going very off, off beat here, but, but the point is, I would say it's got to start with the emotional thing. So either um, if, if, if someone said to me, you know, Mitch, uh, why don't you become a, a professional artist? Immediately, I'd be like, no ways, uh, because I just would feel like I'm not good enough. Um, but maybe there would be something there because I was quite emotional about it. So I had the fear of failure. So I, I like it so much that I don't want to ruin it. Well, then that's maybe something that, you know, you should look into. So I would definitely say start with the logic and try and probe the students and people to think from an emotional point of view first, so that we get into that intensely illogical, high emotional space, whether it's negative or positive, it doesn't matter, it's emotion. And then how do we bring in the logic? So then you kind of start to do a bit of a recon and a stock take and see what makes sense or what doesn't. Or, you know, if, for example, if a student says, well, I'm not really worried about my studies because I'm going to become a professional rugby player and he hasn't made the first team, you know, then we really are in a highly emotional space with very low logic. It, I would say the responsibility lies from, from a logical point of view, but also to understand that if someone's excited about something and it doesn't necessarily make sense, don't shut it out. Like don't blow that flame out um, because it might just be an imposter. They feel like an imposter or they're worried about failing. Um, that doesn't mean they don't have the skill sets to do it. I think the logic is something that can be learned. And as I said, it's shared from external sources. If that thing's burning inside of you, it's already, I would say you're already half the way there. Um, the rest can be, be learned and then focused towards as well. And, th and that's also what's, what's quite interesting is of all the research uh, that I've done in my personal life as well, where I found myself in that analytical restraint where I'm taking very logical uh, viewpoints on doing something. I find myself getting very stuck very quickly versus if I'm going from a highly emotional point of view first. So, so we don't want our kids getting stuck. We want them to be ushered towards. Um, so yeah, that, that would be my, my viewpoint on that. So what, what I'm trying to, to distill here is like what little action plan for, for teachers and for parents that when, when they need to assist their kids in, in making these, these big decisions, like almost like an algorithm, step one, do this, step two, do that. And from what I'm hearing from what you're saying is, I think the first thing is like identifying um, where the emotions lie. What, what are the things yeah. that are really triggering emotions? Because the ones that are like, like there's, there's um, it's like content, contentment. It's like, eh, yeah, meh, yeah. We, don't really, we don't really worry about these. Like put those aside, don't, don't focus on them first. Like when you've got options, identify like all the options and then find out where the emotion lies with each of these, because it'll give at least that gives you a, a starting point. Yeah, agreed. So, so for example, if I talk about my own industry, if you had asked me in matric what I would want to be, I would have said to you, I want to be a guy in marketing. 
I now understand that that means 101,000 different things. There are so many areas that I could find a career in the marketing chain. I mean, advertising is one piece of that whole, whole chain. So it would be important to see, well, okay, marketing is getting him excited. What about it is exciting? Is it the business side? Is it the creative side, et cetera? And then kind of go, go from there and try and, try and point them towards something. I think, uh, you know, from from what I remember at school, I always felt people were trying to point me away from something rather than towards. So I would say find the emotion and then try and get them to point towards. I, I, I like that. And this is like after you've after you've identified where the emotions lie, this is now where the logic, as you say, is important, where the facts become important. Now you do the research. Yeah. What what does it actually mean? to be in marketing and then you go and get the facts and you start making more of a, 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 a cognitive decision instead of an emotional um, like decision. So having all of that come together at the end, you, you basically end up with a smaller selection of decisions that need to be made. Because I think that that paralysis, decision paralysis of there's so many things to decide between, I mean, and I'm freaking out like that that yeah. keeps you inactive. And as you said, like making the decision is already giving you momentum. So the decision to cut certain things out and include certain other things gives you the momentum to continue with the decision-making process. 100%. And if, and if the kids are feeling like I've made this decision to be a marketing guy, then that's what's going to start to light that fire and it's going to start to build. It's going to increase the passion. It's going to increase the emotion. And then... It also will help teachers and, and parents alike to say, well, you know, Mitch, this is what you've decided you're going to do. Has that changed or has it? No, it hasn't. Or Yes, it has. Or what's changed about it? So keeping the emotion is kind of what keeps your the wind in your sails, uh, you know. So, so it's super important that the emotion leads, but the logic has to carry you there. And, that, and that's where I would say the responsibility lies on, you know, the parents, the teachers, to make sure that they're just continuously keeping that child in that respond box of being highly emotional, but the logic is as as closely knit into it because the logic will fall away. When things get hard, I don't want to do this anymore. High emotion. Well, why don't you want to do it anymore? Start asking better questions. Start finding people that have maybe gone down the same journey. Introduce those kids to those people so that they can get inspired again and they can get passionate, you know. It's really, really important that we don't put the emotion out or the flame out because, you know, then you, you're kind of going back into, into that unemotional irrationality space again, which no one's going to make career changing decisions off the basis of that. Well, now mentioning career changes, I think that's another decision because we've, I, I've, I've made a few changes in my life when it comes to this because I had an ideal, I had a, 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 a uh, uh, in my imagination, I thought like, okay, this is what this job entails. And then once you get into it and you experience that, okay, crap, this isn't what I thought this was going to be. And now making a decision to move away from that. Like how, yeah. how do you feel about changing decisions? Yeah. So, so it's, um, this, this would be more of the reflective process more, more than a responding process. So, one of the examples I use in my talk is, you know, Black Friday in advertising. From a sales point of view, it's something that every brand on the planet looks forward to from a sales point of view. And as the consumer, it's a highly emotively charged day. Logic seems to just go out the window on Black Friday. We all log on. We're on our online website. We're excited. We're just adding to cart, add to cart 75% or you swipe that credit card. You're like, yes. I conquered Black Friday, what a machine. And then like a lava lamp rocks up at your door the next day and you're like, why did I buy a lava lamp? Like, are you joking? So, you know, it's it's important to kind of just assess that decision and go, well, I, I just, I love spending money digitally. That's actually what it's about. It's actually got nothing to do with the lava lamp. There might be a bigger problem that I'm trying to deal with here. Um, but but it's it's kind of the same thing. If if you're going to just go and change a decision, you need to be able to reflect on why that initial decision was made first without getting caught in that indecision trap. So you've got to say, okay, well, I've decided to go into marketing. I don't want to do this anymore. Now, if you use that emotional and logical framework together into making that marketing decision, 
I'm fairly confident that that was a well thought out conversa uh, conversation you had with yourself and others. And that's why you're in marketing. If you didn't, that's probably why you're in marketing is because the decision making process maybe wasn't as solid. So sometimes it's more about the way we chose to decide than the actual decision that was made. So it's important to reflect on that. If you then choose to go, okay, well, I, I, I did all the things. I, I, I listened to Mitch's talk. It was amazing. And I'm still now questioning this decision. It's now to go through that framework again. Okay. If it's not marketing, it's accounting. I found that running a business, I'm actually really good at being an accountant. I'm not personally, but hypothetically, you know, accounting seems to be the way to go. Right. What about accounting gets you excited? Why are you looking at accounting? What, what's different to this versus your, your marketing abilities, et cetera? So you start to reframe the question because your emotion, again, is, is, is leading this conversation. The logic behind that is, you know, maybe having a beer with your mate and saying, cool, I want to become an accountant. And they laugh in your face because they're like, you, there's no ways you can do that. <laughs> oh, flip. I feel like I'd be a pretty good accountant. Well, you won't be a good accountant. So it's also then just kind of having that reality check. But again, outside um, influence and then you know as i said reflecting on is it is it the current situation that's maybe not what you imagined it to be that is you are starting to tell the story in your head at night as i mentioned earlier we start to use scenarios and situations as fact when they're not in in fact fact and so maybe at night you know you're lying there going i'd be a great accountant and you tell yourself that enough times you'll start to believe it but the scenario has nothing to do with you being accountant. It's just that you chose marketing and it's hard. And every single day you, 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 you're getting clients, you know, coming down on you that, you know, cash flow is bad. Like you're running a business in a marketing space and it's hard. It's got nothing to do with you being an accountant. So I think it's also just being really aware of the scenario you're in or the situation you find yourself in that, uh, that might be you, what's making you question your decision. But again, the, the same process applies. Whether you've got to make one decision or a hundred, you've got to make sure that you're just keeping those two emotional and logical abilities in check because they are very effective when they stand on their own. No, that's that's very valuable. And I think one of the, the other traps that people fall into is like after they've made a decision, they're, they're afraid of regret. So now they start thinking, yes, what if I made the other decision? What would my life be like if I made the other decision? Like what, what advice yeah. do you have for people who are stuck in that rut? Yeah. So this is, I've also spent a lot of time thinking about this. So, you know, often when, let's say you were asking about hiring staff earlier, you know, sometimes you get someone in the interview, they absolutely ace it and they start and you're like, oh no, what have I done? Why is this person here? Or you have an interview and you're like, it wasn't really great. And then you hear that they've gone on to like run a business department in a competing agency and you go, oh, how did I miss that in the interview? So you kind of start to, to you know, beat yourself up about it because you, you feel you may have made the wrong decision. The important lesson here is that you made a decision. And that's what I said earlier is when you make decisions, the byproduct is confidence. So what happens is the more confidence you build within yourself, the more you have the ability to stay out of that indecision trap because you catch it quickly. You go, okay, whoa, whoa, whoa I'm, I'm starting to procrastinate. I'm feeling anxious about. Now, if you start to ask yourself, man, did I make the wrong decision? Man, did I do? You're starting to communicate poorly with others because you're regretting the choices you made, etc. You're starting to fall into that trap again. Now, the more decisions you make, the quicker you'll get yourself out of that trap. And that's why I said also, it's really important to understand the difference between a decision and a choice. Your choice had very little emotional logic involvement when it was selected, right? So if you now have gone through an interview process, the decision you made was to hire someone for a role. You then interviewed those people and then you have to choose one of those people based on the criteria that you put in front of them. Once you've chosen that, that choice is, is the byproduct of the decision you made to fill that role. If the choice is incorrect, that's fine. You can make another choice, but the decision remains the same and it would be the same thing. So when you're asking yourself, hey, I'm really worried I made the wrong decision, it might just be a choice for that decision that you've made that needs to be reassessed, not the actual decision. So it's important that we remind ourselves what the decision versus choice is. And I think the, the, the other valuable thing here is there's no way you can find out what the outcome would have been if you made the other decision. 
like yeah. people yeah. like if somebody said like um, if i left three seconds earlier i would have been in an accident like there's no way we can't time travel this is not one of those time traveling yeah. movies we parallel universes where you can see where the decision forks were made you can't find that out so stop spending cognitive time or, or your cognitive bandwidth on the on the what ifs like Absolutely. Okay, now I'm unhappy with the decision I made. Now I'm going to make another decision. Just keep moving forward. Or as you said, keep on moving towards. Yeah. And Franz, so the thing I want to also just add to that is there is no such thing as a perfect decision. It doesn't exist. It can't happen. Your perfect decisions only live in the past. So if you go and you're like, yes, that was a good decision. It's because the choices you've made since that decision have worked. Or flip, that was a bad decision. It's because the choice you've ever made since that decision didn't work. So a perfect decision will only exist once it's been made. So you can't make a perfect decision. It's only something that will live in the past. And I think that's also what, uh, you know, in that analytical restraint where you're using high logic and low emotion, you're trying to make the perfect decision. You're trying to come up with a perfect scenario. That's never going to happen. And that's why I'm so hell bent on getting people to make decisions because I've suffered personally in my life where I haven't made enough decisions quick enough. Or I haven't responded appropriately. And it's, you know, it's had very negative effects, but I've also had scenarios in my life where I have responded, where I have made decisions effectively. And that starts to snowball into those situations where they, you know, you feel like the world's getting bigger around you. You feel like you're unequipped. You need your tank to be filled with a bit of confidence. Be like, I actually can make a decision here. I know how to make the right choices. So let's move forward because that's when it matters. If we're not making decisions when it matters most, we shouldn't be the person making the decision. Absolutely. Mitch, I've got two short-ish questions that I want us to, to, to end off on. And the first thing, uh, the first one I want to ask is, what's currently happening in advertising or in marketing that's really exciting you that you think schools should start adopting in their own marketing? That's a very, very good question. I, I think the, the biggest thing for schools is they have a sense of being very traditional. So it's, a, it's an area that is ripe for a little bit of disruption. It's ripe for something different. I mean, we've all seen a mailer or a direct email or a, a, an ad poll with your son at this school, you know, like it's all so stale. So, so I would say um, definitely the, I think there's a big opportunity from a remarketing point of view. So, you know, taking the alumni out of the schools, finding out if they've got kids, again, just, just caring about those people like you did while they were in your school. I think there's something to be done there. And also we're all online there's, you know, I'm sure schools have got a little bit of a blended uh, portfolio that's going to keep going in and out as we get spikes and as there's no spikes. And so it's, what are we doing online to kind of take the conversation so that you're creating net promoters for that school outside of the school environment? I think there's something to be done there as well, without a doubt. I'm, I'm super excited about, about where these two, two worlds meet. So um, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And then now lastly, I think there's massive, massive scope for the keynote that you do and the work that you do to be introduced to schools. I'm just thinking of parents' evenings, subject choice evenings with the grade nines. I'm thinking grade 11s when they need to make decisions on uh, uh, career choices. Um, where can teachers or schools contact you to find out how they can get you to come and speak at their school? Yeah, thanks, Franco. I'd love, I'd love to give back to to schools as well and and help them be more equipped to make these big decisions as the the scholar as well as the 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 teacher and and the parent. So if you go to Mitch to the B.com, uh, you can sign up there and there's a I'll get notified immediately if you want to have a 15 minute chat or you can book me on a day. It's all up there. It's all very easy, um, and that would be the best place to go. Mitch. Thank you so much for spending time with us on the Super Teachers Unite show. Thank you for all the value that you've given us and we're looking forward to working with you in the future. Franco, thanks again. So, so rad to be here and I had an absolute blast. Thank you so much. Yes. Well, that's it for today's show. I hope that you found value and that your classroom or your boardroom is now a better place to work at. Please go check out the website staysuper.co.za to find out how my keynotes, workshops, or mastermind can assist you in teaching like a superhero. Until I see you in person or chat with you online, 
stay super. <laughs>